So, uh, will, will you turn in your Bibles with me? Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. 66 books in the Bible. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. Hebrews is in the New Testament. It might be easier to back up to the last book in the Bible, maps, and then <laughs> go this way. Uh, chapter 12. Most books of the Bible, all books of the Bible are divided into, into verses. Most are divided into chapters and verses. So we're in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 here in just a moment. Hey, tonight, 5 o'clock, um, I hope you'll join us for the spring. That's our monthly instrumental service. We'll have it here in the auditorium, and we're still doing surrender. Surrender. So it's a really great uh, concept, theme, discipline struggle surrender tonight five o'clock in here some years ago i ran across two death notices in the newspaper both with the same last name the 77 year old man and his wife of some years younger and the obituary indicated that they had died on the same day but offered no explanation and I, my assumption was that they had been killed in an automobile accident. That seemed to make the most sense. But I was wrong. Later on in the paper, another section of the paper, I, I found the rest of the story. The husband suffered from acute leukemia, his wife from prominent debilitating arthritis, and both had died from single gunshot wounds, one self-inflicted. They had laid out the suit and the dress in which they wanted to be buried, and they had left a note. First word that comes to my mind when I remember that story and when I first read that story is the word weary. Just weary. I think a lot of other words line up to be considered tired, worn out, fatigued, hopeless, that, that dear couple lost their heart for living, that, that childlike faith that we saw depicted in that beautiful video earlier had just died in them. Their spirits were tired and as worn out as their bodies. They'd given up hope, and they must have felt so alone. The really tragic thing about that is as I don't think they were at all alone with the word weary. I think there are very many very weary, very tired people, and I suspect some of them are sitting in a seat near you, and maybe even in your seat. Some of us are weary because we are trying to overcome obstacles between where we are and where we want to be. In fact, we've tried. We surrounded ourselves with positive thoughts and we taped them up on our mirrors at home and we filled our minds with inspiring stories and we pumped up our attitudes with some of those motivational TED Talks and we set out to accomplish something absolutely spectacular. But then we hit a wall. We ran into an insurmountable barrier we tried and we tried and we just couldn't overcome it and now we sit in the dust of broken dreams we are weary and we are heartbroken too some of us have been worn down by struggling relationships home is supposed to be a shelter in the time of storm a refuge a time and a place of peace and rest but for some of us we come home from the frying pan of a tough job means means jumping into the fire of an intense home environment we're growing wearier by the moment and we're losing heart others of us feel the fatigue of failing health for some of us it's physical your body's not working the way it's supposed to for others, the body is fine, it's the mind that's misfiring. Either way, chronic health problems put pressure on every relationship we have. We worry about the strain on our families, and sometimes, maybe at night, 
when both sleep and peace elude us, we wonder if God even notices. And if he notices, we wonder if he cares. And if he cares, we wonder if he can do anything at all to relieve us. And all of that wondering makes us weary. And then some of us are weary in spirit. We tried to be faithful to God's commands. We did. We tried. We prayed about tough temptations, and we tried. But when they came, we fell again anyway. And for the first time in a long time, this time, we're thinking about not getting up. We're thinking about just staying down. We've lost the heart to try anymore. Name your burden. Somebody in this room has got it. For every person, there is a pressure, a pain, a problem that drains our energy for life and for God and makes us feel like quitting. For every one of us, at some point in our lives, there is something that causes us to lose heart, something that wears us out and just makes us weary. So I thought it would be good while we're in between series just to hear a word from God. Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to the first three verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray. Holy Father, some of us don't even have to turn on the television or boot up our computers to see news about horrible things going on in the world because they're going on right in our own lives. We're weary. Some of us barely made it here this morning. And, and then while we were singing some of these awesome praise songs, we couldn't get our voices past our throats. So we're asking for a word from you this morning to encourage, to lift us up, to give us new energy to live the life you call us to, to run the race that's marked out for us. Pray for relief. Pray for strength. We pray for the presence of your empowering Holy Spirit. And we pray this in the name of your sinless Son, Jesus. Amen. The book of Hebrews, everybody feeling really happy right now? Okay, it's kind of a gloomy start, isn't it? It's going to be okay. We're going to be all right. The book of Hebrews was written to people who were living in the dog days of their faith. They were apparently, judging by what you read throughout the book, they were apparently being tempted to turn back to an old way of life, to give up, to cave into the pressures that they faced. And so before the writer of Hebrews, and nobody really knows who that was. A lot of people think it was Paul. Could have been Paul, could have been somebody else. So I'm just going to refer to him or her as the writer this morning, okay? A lot of, a lot of people think that, that, that the writer wants to talk about this, and so he, he, he is reminding them, first of all, of the advantages that they have been given. I'm going to, I'm going to show you two resources you have if you're a Christian. And, and these are in the text here, and, and they're intended, I think, to call us out of our weariness into greater energy for life and for God. The first advantage is this. The writer says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. He's referring to the, to the people he mentioned in chapter 11. 
a long list of some of the greatest heroes in the Bible. Abel, Enoch, uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, uh, just a whole bunch more. These people, he says, offer testimony to us when we are weary and losing heart. He says these folks are like witnesses. They have personal knowledge and experience that has a direct bearing on what you and I are going through. They are old and dead, but they are relevant. They have seen things that can make a difference for us. They have been where we are and can teach things and te- teach us and testify to us and encourage us to, to hang in there. One advantage that we have as Christians is the evidence of those who've gone before us. Let me show you what I mean. One chapter back, he mentions Noah. You remember Noah, right? The, built, the, built the boat. Um, Steve Carroll played him on TV. The flood. You think Noah might have something to say to people who sort of feel like they're watching the world sink into a swamp, swamp of moral confusion? Noah, Noah could talk about that. He's been there. A moment ago, we, we heard the scripture reading uh, from Hebrews chapter 11. And you heard about Moses' parents. Their names were Amram and Jochebed. Why don't we say that together? Amram and Jochebed. You ready? One, two, three. Amram and Jochebed. It's good. It's Moses' parents. If you're on Jeopardy and the Bible category obscure biblical parents comes up, you'll know the answer to that. You will win, and we do expect you to tithe out of your winnings. <laughs> Amram and Jochebed, raising their, they have this little boy. They're living as slaves in Egypt. They have this little boy. They're in a culture that does not value life. They're in a culture that doesn't honor God. You think they might have something to say to parents about standing strong against the culture, about protecting your children from the false priorities of a society that no longer listens to God, about raising children to honor and obey God in a culture that doesn't reward that. Their testimony encourages parents to be strong and faithful. Moses, their son, has something to say to people who are tempted to compromise their faith for the sake of success. He could have enjoyed all the treasures of Egypt. He was the adopted son of Pharaoh, adopted grandson of Pharaoh. He could have had anything he wanted, and yet he chose to wait for the promises of God. The Israelites who passed through the Red Sea and watched the walls of Jericho fall, they've got something to say to Christians who face seemingly insurmountable obstacles and odds. King David, do you remember King David? David committed adultery and then had the husband of his lover murdered. David can say something about overcoming failure. Rahab? Rahab was a prostitute. She testifies that your past does not have to define your future. Gideon can speak with authority about doing great things with few resources. Abraham, about trusting the future to God. All of these people want to say to us, we have been there. We did that. We are here to tell you that this faith thing works. It will not always be easy. It won't come quickly. Sometimes it'll feel like it's never going to get there, but it works. We, We watched it happen. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't let weary win. Don't worry. They testify to us. That's advantage number one. Great cloud of witnesses. People who by their experience assure us and inspire us that God will make it okay. Advantage number two. This also in verse one near the end. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us we have a great cloud of witnesses people telling us you can do it we've done it we've been there and then 
we've got something that people all over this world wish they had direction we've got direction the race is marked out for us we don't have to guess about it we don't have to search for it we don't have to make it up as we go I think we often look at the Bible and all of its commands as a burden that we have to carry or an authority that we must endure and, and I, can I just be real honest with you sometimes the Bible I'm a preacher sometimes the Bible even for me comes across like a big fat no from heaven God would it be okay if no how about God but no it just comes across like a big no but there's a there's a whole chapter in the Bible back in the Old Testament sort of right in the middle Psalm 119 longest chapter in the Bible and the whole chapter is about the Bible whole chapter is about the Word of God the law of God listen to what the psalmist says there in verse 45 I walk about in freedom because I sought your precepts verse 32 he says I run in the path of your commands for you have set my heart free scripture is is not a corral hemming us in it's not a wall keeping us out of a promised land it's not a bouncer that won't let you go into the party it's not an iron curtain limiting your liberty it's the means by which God has marked out for us the path to freedom to joy and to peace we may wrestle with day-to-day -day decisions we may wonder what to do in particular circumstances in those times we can pray for wisdom and insight but the direction of our lives has been given to us don't forget that always celebrate that advantage we've got a direction but these verses in Hebrews do more than just remind weary people of the advantages that we have they also call us to some action which is really what weary people need isn't it we need to know what to do what are some specific actions I can take to find new energy and new resources for life what can I do to overcome this weariness that's in here there were two guys that were in a hot air balloon and the wind blew them in a direction they had not anticipated and they were absolutely lost they had no idea where they were and, and they looked down and they saw a man walking through a field and so they called out to him sir can you tell us where we are and he looked up and said yes you are in a hot air balloon 150 feet up in the air and one of the balloonists turned to the other and said that guy's a preacher and he said how do you know and he said because what he said was absolutely true and absolutely useless <laughs> okay would that have been funnier if it had been an engineer would that have been better because <laughs> that's how I first heard it because well, my notes said pause for laughter but there <laughs> I don't want to be that guy okay I want to offer some practical specific help and there there are some very practical things we can do when we feel ourselves growing weary I hope one of the things you've already picked up on is the Bible understands there are going to be days like that seasons like that in your life you're not alone and you're not crazy but there are some things we can do the first one is in verse 1 let us throw off everything that hinders we're gonna find new energy new strength if we're going to put some distance between ourselves and the word weary we're going to have to learn to travel light that's what it means when it says throw off everything that hinders if you are in a season of sick and tired there may be some things in your life that you just need to let go for right now and I'm not talking about bad things I'll talk about that in a minute I'm, I'm talking about good things see not everything that hinders us is sinful in fact there may be some very good things in our lives that in and of themselves are absolutely fine but you can have too many good things it's like packing to travel I, I don't even have to put my hand on the Bible I will tell you this I am a terrible packer because I, what I do is I put my suitcase out on the bed and I open it and then I, my, I turn to my 
chest of drawers and I open all them and then I begin taking stuff and putting it from there to here. And pretty soon, I'm, my drawers are empty and my suitcase won't close. I actually have paid more for my luggage than my flight. And I don't really need a suitcase, I need two men and a truck. Because I don't know how to pack. I think we do that with life. I think, we, I think families these days are busier than ever. And it's all good. You're, everything you're doing is good stuff. We, we pack our weekends and our weeks with educational and recreational and spiritual and occupational activities, and they're all marvelous experiences, and we make grand memories, and we end up with zero margin. And then if one thing goes sideways, and something always goes sideways, we're suddenly overwhelmed. Marginless living makes us weary. Time's like money. If you don't make a budget, it's going to get away from you. If you say yes to one thing, you're going to say no to something else. Our spirits, our souls need down time to pray, to worship, to stay fresh, to stay alive. So can I just challenge you with something here? This is a horribly frightening thing for a preacher to tell you to do. Because we're going to start a series in a couple of weeks called Gifted. And it's going to be a call to this church to step up and use our gifts in kingdom work. So what I'm about to tell you is just, it's crazy. I want you to say no to something this week, okay? Not if I call, but (laughs) but I want you to say no to something this week. Okay, you, you, you may need to say no to something really good but if we don't have any margin in our lives we die we grow so weary that we can't say yes to the things that matter most but now not all of the things that hinder are benign they're not all just a matter of over scheduling and saying yes too many times sometimes we're not just hindered, we are entangled. The first action is to travel light, the second is to deal with sin. Verse one says, lay aside the sin that so easily entangles. If you are feeling weary, it may be that there is unconfronted, unconfessed, unforgiven sin in your life. Now I want you to listen very carefully to this next sentence. Are you listening? Listen carefully. I am not saying that the problems, that that if you have problems in your life, then you must have committed some big sin and God is punishing you. The last thing weary people need is to be saddled with that bit of bad theology. There is a phrase for the idea that God sends us problems to punish us for our sins. That phrase is false doctrine. Your devastating diagnosis is not the result of God's anger at your sin. If that's how God operated, how in the name of all that is holy is Hugh Hefner still alive? So I don't want a lot of weary folks walking out of here this morning thinking that all of your problems are because you've sinned. But neither do I want to ignore the fact that sometimes the very reason we feel weary and worn is directly related to the distance we've put between ourselves and God. David knew something about that. Listen to what he wrote in Psalm 32. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my strength sapped as in the heat of summer that sounds to me like somebody who is weary why was David weary verse 5 then I acknowledged my sin to to you and did not cover up my iniquity I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin David felt wasted, weakened, and ruined 
because of the sin in his life. Sins that par- it's, a, it's a parasite that worms its way into your soul and saps off the energy and the drive that make for a lively, invigorated Christian life. If we fail to confront it, <clears throat> if we fail to confess it, we wind up burning even more energy trying to hide it, trying to live a double life. We lack the energy to pray. We lack the desire to serve. We lack the discipline to study. The Hebrews writer says, sin entangles us. It tires your mind. It makes you weary. Earlier I mentioned that we tend to see the scriptures as God's big no. That's not what the scriptures are. Not an iron curtain limiting our, limit, limiting our liberty, but the pathway to freedom. In the same way, I think, we tend to think of sin as the world's big yes. See, if I could just shake off these old laws and rules and commands, then I'd, I'd really be free. But that's just a lie. Sin does not set you free. It entangles you, and it wears you out. If you're feeling a real sense of spiritual lethargy and lifelessness, maybe it's time to look real honestly into your own heart. Take a fearless moral inventory, as our friends in Alcoholics Anonymous say. If there is some sin that has not been confronted, that's what's wearing you out. And that's why the third action is so important. Verse 2, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He is not only the champion and truest illustration of what the life of faith looks like, but he is the only source of power and energy that can breathe life into our faith. So what do we see when we focus on Jesus, when we fix our eyes on Jesus? We see just how serious sin is. Because of sin, Jesus endured the cross and the opposition of sinful people. He bore the shame and pain of the cross. We see that the problem of sin was so serious. You know, you and I think we can, I can, I can be good. I can really, I can be good enough. You realize the problem of sin was so serious that it killed Jesus as he was trying to deal with it. He had to die to deal with sin. That's how serious it is. And when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we realize that. But more than that, we we see the unrelenting love of God. We remember that Jesus came to save sinners from that death. We remember that he once said, come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest we're going to sing a song here it's called the invitation song and maybe they did that in your tradition maybe not if you don't go to church very often this will seem a little weird but here's what we're we're going to try to do if there's anybody in the room that needs prayer right now because of the weary because of the need for rest we're all we're going to stand and then we're going to invite you to come toward the front of the building and we'll gather around you and we'll put our hands on your shoulders and we will pray for you whatever your weariness is it's coming forward is not like holding up a big sign that says hey i just committed a big sin this week and need some help but it might be coming forward is to say i'm weary i'm tired I need you to pray for me let's stand let's sing if you need to come please do peace of god cover me cover me
Thanks for being here. A really good morning, and I hope that you've been lifted and revived by spending your time with us here this morning. Just three things as we close. First of all, as soon as we conclude, there'll be a very short meeting. Um, Dr. Eric Koyu took a group from Twickenham to Israel in 2014. He, with the help of Steve Krieger, are planning another trip in 2017, and they have an informational meeting as soon as we quit in 201, right here to my right. And uh, they will have all the information, details, and dates for anybody who might be interested in finding more about that trip in 2017. Secondly, again, don't forget tonight, the spring, kind of be a continuation of what we shared this morning. We'll be talking about surrender and some of these things that we need to give up to the Lord. And so we'll be focusing a lot on our time together tonight at 5 o'clock, so be back for that. Thirdly, I, I know many of you know George and Terry Bennett from the years in church and, and at church and at Madison Academy. Um, Terry had uh, cancer and she passed away, I believe it was the day before yesterday. Her funeral will be at Madison Academy in the gym tomorrow night at 7, and uh, everyone is welcome to come and attend, and so if you'd like to do that, please keep uh, the family and in your prayers as they go through this loss. Again, just thanks for being here. Be blessed as you go out from here today and as Baylor comes and leads us in prayer. Will you bow with me? Dear God, just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with, that we can all gather together and listen to the word of, that Jody's given us this morning. God, I pray that we can apply that word to our daily lives. God, I want to take this time to pray for the Bennett family and their loss, Miss Terry, and I pray that you lift them up and give them strength. God, I also pray for the families of the victims in the Orlando shooting. God, I pray that you give them peace and comfort. And I pray that there are some good Christians in the city of Orlando that can show your, your son's love to their families so that they may see that we're not discriminating against any different kinds of beliefs or anything that's different than us. God, I pray that we can show love to anybody who's hurting or weary or troublesome or full of heavy burdens. God, most importantly, I thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. It's in his name we pray. Amen.